Uh, could you just give us a synopsis about what your talk is going to be today? I'm going to talk about uh, corporate governance and financial regulation. I'm going to advance what's called the Minsky hypothesis about how uh, leverage creates its own uh, reversal. As for the topic today, uh, it's financial fragility and corporate governance in Ireland today. Um, quite a, an interesting title, I think, and topic given the um, current economic environment we have out there today. And I suppose the, um, let's say, the systemic uh, failure of the uh, banking system and the possible kind of corporate governance issues that lie underneath the, the bonnet of that. Um, you know, uh, certainly there's a, an area ripe for research, I think, alone in that topic. We have today uh, with us Stephen, Dr. Stephen Kinsler of the Kenny Business School in UL. Uh, Stephen teaches and researches in computable mathematical and financial economics. Uh, he has two PhDs in mathematical, uh, mathematical economics and economic history from uh, NUI Galway and the New School of Social Research in New York, respectively. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, Stephen uh, uh, hosts a very popular blog, um, uh, stephenkinsella.net, and I certainly suggest to all of you that it's well worth a, a click in and a read. Um, there's a lot of interesting material in there. Um, I'll, uh, that's enough from me. I think I'll pitch it over to Stephen now to um, kick off this topic. Thank you, well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be invited today. I'm really chuffed to be able to uh, speak to you. Um, I have a brother who's doing the CFA at the moment. And I, I know that's a valuable qualification to have because he's a really clever guy. He's twice as smart as I am. And he doesn't say the word CFA without goddamn in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really tough. If it's tough for him, that means it's worth something. So uh, I, I, I'm really quite pleased uh, to be able to talk to you guys as well. The other, the other reason that I think it's really apt to be talking to you is that uh, if we get this particular subject right, then you guys will have no end of work at all, you, because this, you are the guys who are going to be implementing the type of measures I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to start today's talk off with uh, a tale about a wedding. <coughs> I was at a wedding in, in Cork la last weekend, and I was at that table, I'm sure you've all been at that table, where you were kind of the random table, you know? You're, you're sort of, you show up and you don't really have anything to do with any, anybody else, but you're those people in the bride or groom's life that are kind of went, ah, we have to invite him. Then go there. <laughs> so it was a case of, hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? Walking around, hello, hello, hello. And, uh, and everybody asked, what do you do? And three of the eight people at the table said, I'm unemployed. And it was sort of a, kind of a hooker at a funeral, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like... Somebody made a joke about, I don't know, the Ireland match or something, the Lions tour, and we kicked off again. I told my father about it, and he said, you know, in the 80s, we didn't say, what do you do? <coughs> we said, uh, how is it going? <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, there's a distinct, uh, distinct uh, deflating of the amount of hubris uh, in people of your generation. And I said, yeah, that's probably right. So I'm going to start to talk off with a little bit of hubris. Uh, I'm going to, uh, Messing. So I don't think we're anywhere near the situation that prevailed in the 1970s. Spread for 19, 2008. The central problem of depression prevention has been solved for all practical purposes. Robert Lucas, Nobel Laureate, 2003. Um, I think certainly in Ireland there's, there's a certain uh, deflated, <coughs> deflated a level of hubris that we're going to see uh, in the next little while. And I certainly think that with respect to corporate governance. No, sorry. That's not right. That's not right. We, we, we haven't solved the problem of depression prevention because we're in one, according to O'Rourke and Eichen Green and many other serious uh, scholarly commentators. And I think that the realization that we are in one and the, and the, and the, the truth about how we got here uh, is heavily reliant on the fact that we, we didn't really put the rules in. So we didn't put the rules in to stop and forestall what we're seeing. So this is just 
You've all seen this picture a thousand times at this stage. This is assuming an 8% drop in GDP, which is conservative and quite nice, actually. This is the sort of picture that the headline figure for, uh, for the last little while. Um, it could be worse, it could be better. I think the point is the precipitous nature of the current drop. What I want to talk to you about today is corporate governance and financial fragility in Ireland. The point of the talk, and, and feel free to fall asleep right after this, if you're tired, if you've had too many sandwiches, if, you, if you've got more important things to think about, the only thing I'm going to talk about today is we should have made the rules tighter years ago. And I'll explain what I mean by rules and explain what I mean by tighter, but feel free now to switch off and chill out if that's what you want to do for your lunchtime. Okay. What I want you to learn about today, <coughs> definition of governance, a history of, cur of currency crises in the last little while, not currency crises, governance crises, and an answer to the question, who does and who should regulate banks and financial intermediaries? The truth about it is that Ireland does have a history of differing corporate governance structures, uh, and the history is very interesting because um, we essentially take what we think is best practice, but what at the time was best practice. And we import that wholesale, mix it with some local regulations, and once that's done, we uh, call that our corporate governance structure. And I'm very interested to, to read the history of this stuff, um, and in particular how it compares with other uh, regulatory structures, for example, the FDIC in the States. Uh, so, let me tell you about Hyman Minsky. That's Minsky there. He is an absolute outlier in the history of economic thought. He's come into vogue rather quickly. Um, because he defines something called a Minsky moment, which is a certain point at which banks realize that their loan to deposit ratio is so high that they can't possibly cover everything uh, with overnight lending, or, or yes, with their overnight lending. So they end up in a situation uh, where they, they almost have to default. So it's this sort of precipitous moment where they realize, uh, you know, that's the Minsky moment. And it's become common, common cur cur currency. Uh, amongst uh, Wall Street traders, and oh, how, when did the Minsky ha moment happen? How did it happen, and so forth? And people spend a lot of their time reading uh, chapter 13 of Minsky's big book, which is Stabilizing an Unstable Economy, 1986. There's a reprint out on Amazon.com. You can get it for about 14 bucks. It's even available on Kindle now. So check it out if you want to. A very well written book. It's extremely uh, non mathematical, although he does refer to nationalist statistics quite a lot. But Minsky essentially did his PhD in Harvard under Vasily Leontiev, one of the great uh, input-output uh, macroeconomists in the world, and wrote a fascinating and, and genial article in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is the best journal in economics, and then promptly disappeared to Washington, uh, St. Louis, uh, Missouri, uh, where, he, where he basically beavered away on these particular models. And the, he, he was blackballed from the economics profession for many, many years, because the theory that Minsky espoused is that through an endogenous credit cycle, by developing levels of credit within the economy, so there's no exogenous shocks, which is what the mainstream uh, e economists would like you to believe is happening, the system creates its own reversal. That's vital. That's, that's the one big point uh, today. The system creates its own reversal. There's a for there are forces that work within the economy. So it's not some external force that's hitting you. Yeah, it's not the subprime crisis. The truth is you brew the subprime crisis yourself. Okay, so what happens? Credit markets will breed their own reversal. How do they do that? One, cheap interest rates lead to increased lending. Two, this leads to increases in leverage, through the, and th therefore you can start seeing statistics in the loan to deposit ratio of different banks and financial, other financial institutions. Perverse incentives re breed, uh, and this is a technical term, dodgy financial incentives uh, via financial innovations. You can look at this in the junk bonds in the, in the, in the 80s. CDOs, etc., uh, in the 90s, and in, in, in 2010, 2020, there'll be more financial innovations. If you, he, he looks back, you know, the truth about it is this is not over. This all has happened before and will happen again. Um, so we see these junk bond CDOs and so forth. Financial innovations, hey, I've got the new thing. I've got the new thing. Come buy the new thing. You're fine. Uh, and then something changes. But it doesn't matter what it is, something changes. The point is that the the economy has become unstable to the point that it can no longer sustain itself on the trajectory that it is on. Once you're there, the banks will fail. Big banks will fail unless they get bailed out by a big bank, big government. Uh, Minsky called the, the Fed the archetypal uh, big bank. <coughs> and big government is, of course, the New Deal government that was uh, successively winnowed down 
uh, decade after decade by successive Republican administrations. Um, so.